Welcome to the autumn meeting of the National Academy of Sciences Committee on Earth Resources. We have an engaging and hopefully thought-provoking uh, meeting planned for today. My name is Jim Slutes and I serve as chair of the committee. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that while today we are gathered virtually, the National Academies is physically housed on the traditional land of the Nunkach Tunk, Tunk and Piscataway peoples past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who steward it throughout the generations. We honor and respect the enduring relationships that exist between these peoples and nations of this land. We thank them for the resilience in protecting this land and aspire to uphold our responsibilities to their example. We hope this meeting will provide an opportunity for participants and, and attendees to reflect on colonialism and its ongoing effects and to center the communities that are affected in our work. We also want to acknowledge that the expertise held by different native communities is crucial to this work. The Committee on Earth Resources is a standing committee of the Board on Earth Sciences and Resources, Earth Sciences and Resources, and serves the community by monitoring and engaging on issues relevant to energy and non-fuel mineral resources. The committee examines issues related to the availability, supply, delivery, and impacts of energy and mineral resources. The health and safety of the workforce engaged in resource exploration and production and the management and stewardship of the lands on which they are located. The committee serves stakeholders with objective evidence based scientific and engineering information. To help support decision and policy making and committee I will add committee members serve as volunteers in this effort. On the screen before you see a list of our committee members and before we get underway, we'll quickly introduce the committee. The committee bios are available on the National Academy's website. We have an exciting program, so we won't do long extended introductions. I'm just going to uh, just uh, let you know everybody's name. Uh, hi, I'm I, again, I'm Jim Slutes. I work for the National Petroleum Council, a federal advisory committee. Uh, joining me on the committee are Bridget Ayling from the University of Nevada, Reno, Dan Connell from Console Energy Incorporated, Doug Hollett, uh, who's with Melroy Hollett Technology Partners, uh, and uh, the uh, John Marsden with Metallurgium, Deborah Peacock with Peacock Law, Ian Robertson Tate from Geothermax, Tamika Searcy, BP America, and David Spears uh, with the Virginia Department of Energy. I also want to acknowledge and express our appreciation uh, for the longstanding and continuing support of our sponsors, which are the Department of Energy, both the Fossil Energy and Carbon Management Office, and the Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Office, uh, specifically the Geothermal Technologies Group, and the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, and again, specifically their, their mining, mining group. So. Again, thank you for our, to our sponsors and thank you to our committee members and you'll be seeing them throughout the meeting as we as we uh, move along. So, so over the past year, the committee has been exploring aspects of, of energy of, of the energy transition within our mission of Earth Resources. A fundamental pre premise that has evolved is that all future energy scenarios will require Earth Resources. These Earth resource needs are likely to have greater breadth in science and technology than past demands. This will include technology for carbon storage, expanded opportunities for geothermal energy, and growing demand for critical minerals. In our spring 2021 meeting, which we, you know, a few months ago, we explored in detail the role of critical minerals and materials in the energy transition. If, if you weren't able to join us, then we invite you to review the video webinars of those sessions available on the committee website at the National Academy. In 2022, we'll be continuing Earth Resource from Emerging Issues, Opportunities, and Challenging. So please stay tuned to our future meetings. But one component common among all the Earth Resource communities is the evolving workforce needed to support Earth Resources 
for the energy transition. The issue of developing new talent for the coming decades remains a relevant and possibly growing challenge. In part, this is because a new generation of potential earth, of scientists and engineers are not necessarily seeing the critical role and breadth of earth resources will play in both for future energy and environmental stewardship. Furthermore, it is in an environment where the earth resources science and technology community is less diverse than other STEM fields. There's data to show that earth resource STEM fields have made little progress in diversity over the past few decades. The committee's autumn 2020 meeting titled Pathways Toward the Future, Just, Equitable, Diverse, an inclusive energy workforce address this issue. The objective of the 2020 meeting was not just to highlight the issue, to, but to position the committee to be a part of the solution and future activities. Today's meeting is the direct outgrowth of the work last December. Today's meeting on Earth Resources Career Fair is the follow on action steps from last year's meeting. First, let me acknowledge that today's event is a pilot project. We are hopeful that this pilot will lead to an ongoing National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine Earth Resources career event. Everyone who is participating is part of the pilot project and we appreciate all of your contributions to make this a success. And we also value your feedback um, as, we, as we move forward. So, so with that, we're gonna get underway, but I'll mention a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. An important part of our meeting today is for our committee and audience to have the opportunity to engage with our speaker and panelists. You see on the agenda that we have a couple points for that to take place. For committee members, school participants and agency representatives, would like to ask a question of our panelists, please use the raise the hand feature in Zoom so we can unmute you. For the public attendees watching the webcast, please contribute your ideas into Slido and we'll work to bring those into the conversation. So with that, let me, let me get, move to get us started and I'm pleased to introduce our keynote speaker. Recording in progress. Oops, I just... Um... Hello. Yeah. Oh, wait, just a second. Okay. Ta I'm, I'm sorry. I, I had a little technical glitch there, Tanya. Let me just do your introduction. Uh, uh, Tanya Trujillo, the Assistant Secretary of Water and Science, is a water lawyer with more than 20 years of experience working on complex natural resources management issues and interstate and transboundary water agreements. She most recently worked as a project director with the Colorado River Sustainability Campaign. Before then, she served as the executive director of the Colorado River Board of California. She has served as senior counsel to the U.S. Center, Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee and as counselor to the Assistant Secretary of Wa for Water and Science at Interior. A native New Mexican, Tanya attended Stanford University and the University of, of Iowa College of Law. Tanya, I'll turn, it over, turn the floor over to you. Sorry about that little glitch there. <laughs> No problem. Thank you very much. And thank you to the National Academies for hosting the event today and for including me in this discussion. My office at the Department of the Interior is located very close to the National Academy building there on the mall in Washington. And I have been able to walk over there frequently. And one of my favorite stops is to say hello to the great statue that you have of Albert Einstein sitting sitting on the mall. I appreciate being, uh, being here with you all today. I am a native New Mexican. I am a lawyer by background and have, a, have had a variety of experiences in my career, always working very closely with technical experts from a variety of fields, whether it be geologists or hydrologists or economists or social scientists, it's great to have a, a lot of different uh, expertise, areas of expertise that have fed into my career and enabled me to really have some incredible experiences. And that's probably the biggest recommendation I would have just going into this type of a, a career discussion is that I recommend 
to all of the young people who are listening in to be able to be very open and to be able to say yes to the opportunities that are are available. I know the the mindset of yes I can is something that has benefited me and I really appreciate just now that I'm working as an assistant secretary at the Department of the Interior, I get to work very closely with the USGS science teams and the Bureau of Reclamation as the two bureaus that I work most closely with, but I work also with the other secretary's offices, whether it be Fish and Wildlife and Park Service or the Energy Minerals groups or the Native American offices. We have a great team at Interior and I encourage uh, all of the young people who are looking looking to start their careers to check us out for opportunities. I, of course, am also honored to be able to work very closely with our secretary, Deb Holland. She is the first Native American secretary of the Department of the Interior and has been a great role model and colleague for, for all of us as, as we've started with our administration this year. I know that this uh, presentation in the forum is designed to provide some background information to undergraduates who are studying in the earth and environmental sciences areas. And I would say you are absolutely at the right place at the right time. The challenges that we are seeing and facing in our world on climate change, on energy issues, on sustainability and response to increasing hazards that, that we're seeing as a result of that changing, changing climate, those challenges are very daunting. And it will require not only a good basis in technical science and technical capabilities, but also good people. And so I appreciate the ability to highlight and, and emphasize the need to approach these challenges with, from a variety of backgrounds, from a variety of cultures and traditional ecological knowledge as well to help bring a well-balanced approach to how we are putting our solutions together. There is no doubt that climate change is real and it is affecting us throughout all of our communities in a lot of different ways, not only from the drought conditions that I, I work closely with in the Western United States, but also increased situations relating to flooding, the extreme heat circumstances, the extended wildfire uh, situations that we're seeing in many places, all of those types of conditions really em emphasize the need to have that strong technical basis for how we're approaching the, the response efforts and our mitigation efforts as well. We want to continue to to make strides in those response efforts, and utilize the best available science as we do our work. It, is, it has really been an absolute honor to be able to work very closely with the teams at the um, USGS. And I've also had the opportunity to work as uh, the uh, chairperson for the department's science bureaus in general. We have a science advisory council that includes representatives from all of our bureaus and all of our missionaries. And it really emphasizes the need for us to be coordinating among the different mission areas that we have in the different bureaus, but also to um, coordinate with our federal sister agencies. And I know we have representatives from Department of Energy here as, as um, we work closely together on some of the minerals issues that we have been carefully tracking, but we also work closely with other agencies such as the EPA and the Department of Agriculture and the Corps of Engineers. All of our missions contain overlapping areas and we have a common need to utilize this, the science foundations that we have available to be able to build, build on our expertise and solve, solve those problems. At uh, USGS and DOI, we have been taking efforts to emphasize the need to include a wide variety of our constituents in our discussions. We have tried, been working hard to build communities and, and affinities and emphasize the equity and 
conditions that we want to encourage. And we have USGS has started some support groups and in, in collegial efforts among black scientists, among Hispanic professionals, among women in science and early career scientists. Those are grassroots efforts that are available to help our, um, our communities and help our workforce be integrated and be successful in, in their missions. We are working on incorporating those types of priorities into our strategic plans and are committed to emphasizing the diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility goals for our workforces. I've been very fortunate to be able to work closely with the teams at Interior that are prioritizing the STEM programs and emphasizing the need to reach out to young people in our communities and help encourage them to be involved in the science, technology, and math areas. And I look forward to continuing that throughout my tenure. I have a couple of great examples that would be, I think are, are interesting. And again, I'm honored to be able to be participating in some of these efforts. One of my favorite uh, pro programs or, or groups that I've been able to connect with so far is the is known as the Ladies of Landsat program. And that is a group that uh, is involved with our Earth Observation Program. <laughs> and they do the many different types of technical work to support the Earth Observation programs that we have available. The Landsat program has been in place for 50 years. It has provided a continuous record of observations of from, from the satellites to, uh, to us here on Earth to help us make decisions about our land management practices, to help us document the continuing changes we see in, in our various communities, whether it be in our oceans and coastal regions or our, our desert Southwest areas. And that is a, it is a global program. So we have teams from all over, all over the world who are connected and coordinating on these issues. But the, the Ladies of Landsat was a group that I had come across in connection with tracking activities at USGS and the Landsat program. And I first saw them on Twitter and I wasn't really sure what, what it, to make of it. But when I was able to participate recently, just in September of this past, a, a month ago, we were part of the effort to successfully launch the Landsat 9 satellite. So the Department of the Interior and USGS was a co coordinating entity with our partners at NASA for the successful launch of that satellite. And it was great to be actually able to meet some of the founding members of the Ladies of Landsat group and to realize that they are actually incredibly talented and great scientists who are working on these programs from across the nation and, and in other countries as well. So it, it is something that I know one of the panels will feature our, uh, our colleague Nikki Tooley from the Navajo Nation in my home state in New Mexico, and um, who she is, has been using the Landsat data to communicate back with her communities and to help on the water supply issues that we uh, are so critical in our areas. The, the other good example I have, again, to, to just highlight my home state of New Mexico, is uh, there is a research chemist and engineer from who works at USGS who grew up in a small town in New Mexico where her father was an underground uranium, uranium miner. And she uh, was able, has been able to earn a PhD in environmental engineering work and came to the USGS on a Mendenhall postdoctoral fellowship. She is now working at USGS and is uh, studying the impact of energy and minerals resources development on the uh, on the environment. And I look forward to, to meeting her at some time. She's also named Tanya, Tanya Gallegos. And so I look forward to seeking her out and getting, getting to say hello sometime. I know we have many other examples of colleagues that have 
grown up in our USGS system and who have prioritized the idea of mentoring and encouraging the next generation of science experts. I am aware of one example, a man named Bill Bromery, who was the first black geophysicist at USGS. And he started as an undergraduate at Howard University in DC and began a tradition of mentoring at USGS that has continued today. He um, is, is again, one of many examples that has had that type of an influence on, on our communities. One, one of the areas that I wanted to um, focus on was the fact that USGS does offer several different types of internships across its science areas, its, its various mission areas for undergraduate students and recent graduates. There are uh, three particular programs that I would like to highlight. Uh, there is a cooperative summer fellowship program, a pipeline program for internships, and a pathways internship program. So I encourage all of you to look into those opportunities. We also have programs from some of our various bureaus at Interior, the National Park Service offers geoscientists in the park program internships, and those uh, are administered through a partnership with the Geological Society of America. In addition, the Bureau of Land Management sponsors the GeoCores, which is a geoscience internship through the geological, again, through the Geological Society of America. All of our land management agencies have partnerships and, and programs that are available to, to young people to help encourage uh, a, a greater involvement in the, in the earth sciences area. I know from the uh, Bureau of Reclamation, there is also significant interest in trying to encourage the STEM programs and expand the interest in, in those areas. We have various educational opportunities at our centers in places like California, in the Great Basin area, which is um, in the border between California and Nevada and Idaho in that, in that region. We have model bridge building competitions and tours of facilities really to help encourage the, the accessibility of, of the information that we have available. We have, Bureau of Reclamation has internship programs for uh, people to, that can be coordinated with the American Conservation Experience and the Great Basin Institute, just as two examples of what's available. Those um, programs are part of what we're doing on a daily basis to try to encourage that cap those capabilities. I am very happy to be a cheerleader for all of these programs and happy to be available for, for questions or, or any, any additional feedback that folks might have for our programs. Thank you very much to the academies for sponsoring this day, and I'm happy to stay connected with your work. Thanks, Tanya. Uh, we appreciate you joining us and, and giving a, a great kickoff with some great examples. And what I'm going to do is just remind folks that uh, 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 that that if there's any of the folks that are on Zoom, you can raise your hand, and uh, and and we'll we'll call upon you. And if there's uh, and and we'll figure out. And if if you're uh, on the public version, enter your questions on Slido, and uh, and that will. That will be pl placed into the chat so we can see them, so we can uh, uh, ask those questions as well. So um, uh, let me just look quick. I don't want to, I'm going to ask you uh, if while we're waiting and people are thinking, and sometimes there's just a slight delay on the, on the, uh, the written questions. But, uh, but Tanya, one of the things I commonly get asked when I'm talking with students say, you know, you, you, you know, for those of us that have been in our careers for a, a couple, a few decades, we tend to, we, you know, people look at our, our, our LinkedIn or our resumes and they're like, oh my God, how do you get all that experience? And, um, and so sometimes it's helpful for people to understand that we didn't, we didn't start running agencies. <laughs> 
<laughs> we we started like everybody else with an internship or or that first job and and I think uh, if you don't mind sharing some of your your history on that and how you you know what was way back before you envisioned being an assistant secretary. A absolutely and I think I've been so fortunate to have a series of really great mentors throughout my career and have been able to have jobs that have really built upon each other in some, in some ways, I, I do reflect back to what I said originally of just having the ability to say yes to opportunities when they come in. I did, I went to law school out of college and went, uh, went to law school with the hope of being able to work in natural resources areas. And coming from New Mexico, I, I have a strong appreciation for just how precious water resources in particular are and how important it is to, to understand how to navigate around those, type, those types of issues. So I was able to work in a private practice firm with some incredible lawyers that helped me you know, get my feet on the ground, but then was also open to transitioning from you know, a, a law firm environment in private practice to, to the public sector and working directly with the state of New Mexico on behalf of um, the interstate issues that, that the state it, it deals with. And that was an incredible opportunity to work with, with many colleagues and technical experts from the other states, from the federal government, from the Republic of Mexico, and really understanding that some of our issues, from my perspective, there's a great benefit to having a lot of different input and feedback and, and looking at problems from a lot of different perspectives, which helps us reach agreements in some pretty complicated scenarios that, uh, that we're involved with. So I've, you know, I've, been able, I've been able to do a lot of different things and have experience in the federal, federal government and some of the other state backgrounds and in nonprofit and NGO capacity. So I encourage that, that type of, of, of broad ranging uh, perspectives, which is great. I, I, I think there's a lot to be said and something that you mentioned, Tanya, that, that I just want to emphasize is the role of mentors and finding people to work with as you go through the career. And it's, it's quite when you think back and sometimes you don't even think of them as they were your friends that you worked with, but you realize in hindsight, they were incredible mentors and, and, and helping guide you. And, and we did have a question that comes, comes in that, that I want to ask you, and I'm particularly want to see how you answer this, having, having in a, in a many years ago served as in a different aging as an assistant secretary. So, so, um, uh, so we have someone that's asked what, what your average, what is your average day-to-day -day job like? Well, one of the one of the great pleasures I have is that no no day has been the same, and it is it is really uh, it is really fun. And I'll just highlight the fact that I get to work with USGS, which is involved in everything within the Department of the Interior, but also so many different types of programs in uh, within each of the states and in other countries. And highlighting things from the satellite launching efforts the, and the earth observation efforts from outer space to investigations really at the, the core of the planet and the geological foundations that we, um, we have available to us. So it's, it's a broad ranging amount of work and I, I love it. It's a tremendous experience I'm very grateful for. Thanks. So we have one, I do, one additional. These question. days, I do. I do a lot of Zoom calls, like everyone else, and I know we're all <laughs> looking forward to to uh, transitioning to the uh, the pandemic free environment that that we had before. Yeah. The um, so what you didn't mention, and just for everybody knows, is is that that Tanya is doing a lot of Zoom calls, and they probably there's probably scheduled every 30 minutes and they go more than six hours a day plus plus and then then toward the evening you get time to do your email that's right I started <laughs> I started today I actually started today with a congressional hearing I was a I was a witness on behalf of the Department of the Interior and the administration in the House Natural Resources Committee providing testimony on four different pieces of legislation I'll be presenting in this this conference uh, today, now, and then later tonight, later this afternoon, I'm making remarks at a 
Rocky Mountain Mineral Law Foundation Conference. So that's part of my work as well. And then interspaced in between are discussions relating to Columbia River Basin issues and California issues and Colorado River Basin issues. So lots of lots of interesting work that's that's uh, we have going on at the department. Yeah, Tanya, we have one of our committee members who has has raised their hand from New Mexico. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> and and so let me call on Deborah. I have one real quick question after Deborah gets done. And I know we only have a few minutes left in the session. So Deborah, let me uh, let me go to you. Tanya, thank you from New Mexico for all you've done for our state and now um, in the federal government. And it, it's great that you're talking about your background because with careers as a lawyer, um, you're, you're doing many different things. So um, people don't have to be engineers or scientists. They can have all sorts of careers in order to be involved in natural resources. And I'm, I'm really happy that you pointed out all of your different background um, experiences. So anyway, thank you um, from New Mexico and we're really happy to have you here. Well, thank you very much. And I, I wanna emphasize the important role of, of communications and just really encourage anyone who's listening to follow any of the Twitter accounts or the Instagram accounts that the Department of Interior has. We put out a tremendous amount of information about our issues. The USGS alone has some really, really, really fun things to, to watch, whether it be from volcano uh, tracking to stream gauging um, stories. And they do try to highlight the human side of what of what we are working on and emphasize the tremendous human resources that we have available. There's a great federal workforce that we have and I compliment all of them for their many contributions. Tanya, there was one question, it would be a real quick one to get to wrap up. And it was just one of our universities has asked if you could, could re-mention the three internships that USGS has. And, and, and just for our university folks, uh, there is gonna be a breakout session with USGS. So I'm sure they can delve into that a little bit more, but, but Tanya, if you could just re-mention re those again. You, you bet, and I'll just pull up my notes again because I didn't have them memorized. <laughs> We have Cooperative Summer Fellowship Program, which, and these are, these are online. I have, um, I don't have the link up in front of me, but I checked them out before I came as part of this presentation. We have a Pipeline Program Internship, and then the Pathways Internships, which is broader. It's not USGS specific, but some of these are great examples for, for how to build, you know, come into the workforce and get a get a wide variety of experiences. So please, please check them out. And we'll let our, well, this will be a, that'll be a heads up for our USGS colleagues for the breakout to be prepared to answer questions on those. Yep, exactly. <laughs> well, Tanya, thanks so much for helping kick, you know, for kicking us off today. Uh, and best wishes for your tenure in the federal government have, uh, having, uh, having done that that role in the past. I, I want to thank you for your service, and uh, it is it really is a, a public service, and and we all around the country should appreciate everyone that that steps up to do that. So thank you, and thank, thank you, you very for joining much. us it's today. Great. It's great to have partners there at the National Academies. So with that, we're gonna we're gonna transition now to our our panel discussion, and. Um, and so to get us underway on that, I'm going to uh, introduce uh, one of my fellow committee members who will be moderating that session. And that's uh, Tamika Searcy. And uh, Tamika serves as the Petroleum Systems Analyst Community of Practice Lead at BP America. And uh, Tanya is... Uh, She's had a 16 year career at BP, has been oriented towards petroleum exploration and production work in various basins within Wyoming, the North Sea, Gulf of Mexico, Latin America. She's originally from Georgia and uh, she was part of the Fort Valley State University's Mathematics, Science and Engineering Academy while still in high school. Um, she, in, she uh, went to school at Fort Valley State University and the University of Oklahoma. 
And so uh, uh, there's there's more on her bio in the in the meeting and on the website. And in the interest of getting her underway in our our, uh, our panel, uh, Tamika, I'm just going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Jim. As mentioned, I'm Tamika Searcy. I'll be the moderator for the panel discussion over this next hour. Uh, this diverse panel will illustrate how to build a STEM-oriented career within government agencies. Having spent nearly 17 years as a geoscientist in the petroleum industry solely with one company, I'm excited about the panel. Each panelist will take two or three minutes to share his or her path with you. Let's begin discovering Mamadou Diallo. Dr. Diallo is a program director of the Division of Chemical Bioengineering, Environmental and Transport Systems at the National Science Foundation. Dr. Diallo. Thank you very much, uh, Tamirka. Thank you, uh, everybody. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share uh, my background and path. Uh, uh, so I'm going to actually build upon what uh, Assistant Secretary uh, Tanya uh, Trujillo, I believe, said about follow the opportunity, say yes to the opportunity. I am actually the perfect illustration of that. So I grew up in Senegal, West Africa, uh, and my first opportunity was a scholarship to go to Morocco to study mineral engineering. So I went to a school of mines. Uh, and to study metallurgical and mineral processing. So I came back to Senegal. The second opportunity was I had a scholarship to come to the United States to study English and go to graduate school at Colorado School of Mines. And at Colorado School of Mines, I studied chemical engineering uh, and I graduated uh, and left, came to Washington DC because most of uh, African student and Senegalese, there was a vibrant community there. So there I had an opportunity at Howard University to serve as a research associate in civil and environmental engineering. So you figure I'm a mineral engineer, so why would I do environmental engineering? So they explained to me uh, the job which, in, uh, which involved understanding how to clean up the environment using surfactant. So surfactants are like soap molecules. So I'm like, well, maybe I don't know much about this, but I accepted the job. And in the process, I learned a lot about colloidal chemistry and others. While I was at Howard, uh, a group of professors from University of Michigan came uh, in environmental engineering and they were working with Howard University to build a center uh, called Center for Hazardous Substance Research. They are like, well, you know, we wanna, include surfactant research. Are you interested in coming to Michigan for graduate school to work on this? I'm like, yes. So I actually went to Michigan, had a full research assistant to do my PhD in environmental engineering. Again, I just followed the opportunity. While at Michigan, I was working uh, on my thesis and I realized, well, I really don't understand enough of colloidal chemistry to really do my work. So then my advisor said, you know, Michigan has this opportunity where you could earn a master's in physical chemistry or any chemistry while you're doing your PhD in environmental engineering. I'm like, yes, I like to do that. So anyway, to cut the story short, I earned my master's in physical chemistry and PhD in environmental engineering. So as I was doing my uh, graduate uh, studies, again, opportunity, a Caltech professor came at Michigan to give a talk in environment, uh, in uh, chemistry. So I attended the talk. It's like, you know, we got the chance to talk to uh, Professor Harry Gray. He's like, I have this Caltech faculty who's really interested in petroleum chemistry, colloidal science and all those. I think maybe your background match. And since you're interested in physical computational chemistry, why don't I uh, connect to you guys? So one thing led to another. After my PhD at Michigan, I got a, uh, essentially postdoc to go to Caltech to do chemistry. So at Caltech, I developed essentially computational chemistry skill. To fast forward, right now at NSF, I am an environmental engineering program director, and my background enabled me to work with 
program director, from chemistry, from geoscience, others. And this is something that I never planned. So follow the opportunity. Thank you. Excellent, Dr. Diallo. Next up, we'll have Jordan Marie Dudley, a project manager and planetary geochemist under a Jacob Jets contract. Jordan Marie. Hi, Tamika. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Jordan Marie Dudley. Uh, I currently work as a project manager and a planetary geochemist for Jacobs Technology on the JETS contract at Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Uh, so I've been in Houston um, for about three years now. Um, and the first two and a half years, I worked primarily as uh, a scientist doing research. And then I recently started working as a, as a project manager this past May. And so the Project management part of my job looks like managing the contract budget and finances for a team of uh, 29 research scientists um, in order to, to complete our research uh, projects for our NASA customer. And so um, the other side of the work that I do, the actual science part of my job, um, allows me to partake in that research, studying astromaterials samples from space. Uh, and mostly looking at hydrogen in anomaly and hydrous minerals in uh, Martian meteorites and other differentiated meteorites, um, and then working on some method development for analysis of lunar samples. As far as my background prior to this, uh, so I grew up in a, a very small city in Meriden, Connecticut uh, on the East Coast, um, and I was the, the first in my family to, to venture out, leave the city um, and get a college degree. And so uh, after high school, um, I went to Boston University to study chemistry and visual art. Um, and then once I finished uh, my undergraduate uh, career, I realized I didn't actually know what I wanted to do with my chemistry degree, but I was interested in earth science. So I took a year off and um, I decided to explore different careers, uh, specifically in earth sciences, that I could apply my chemistry background to. Um, so I took some classes uh, at a local state school. Um, I did an internship in the mining industry with Freeport McMoran in Arizona. Um, I worked some other jobs, selling coffees, trying to pay, pay tuition. Um, and then the, the pivotal decision that I made uh, that is what led me to my job today was that um, I decided I wanted research experience to see if I wanted to go to graduate school. So I, uh, I made a list of professors in geology departments in Connecticut, and I reached out to them and I asked them if I could volunteer in their labs. I explained that I had a chemistry background um, and that I was interested in figuring out what I could do with that. And so the, the one professor that responded to me, uh, what actually ran a solar system geochemistry laboratory at Wesleyan University. And uh, so I ended up volunteering there for a full year uh, and I absolutely loved it. Um, and I was amazed that I could use um, this small scale lab chemistry and apply it to these very large solar system phenomena. Um, and so I ended up doing my master's there um, and working with the professor that I had volunteered with as my thesis advisor and then landing a NASA fellowship, uh, writing a thesis on water anomaly and hydrous minerals and meteorites. And then uh, through networking, presenting my work at the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference uh, here in Houston, Texas, um, I eventually ended up getting this position and moved to Houston. Uh, so that's just a little bit about me and my background. Thank you, Tamika. Thanks, Jordan Marie. What a solar experience you've had. Uh, thank you. We'll move on to someone closer to the student's journey, Elizabeth Smith is a PhD student at the University of Delaware studying plant and soil sciences. Elizabeth. Yes, hello. I am a, um, like I said, closer to the student experience. I'm a 2018 graduate of Spelman College. So hello to my Spel Spelman siblings and my former advisor, Dr. DeCarl, I saw he was on the call, and also a graduate of the uh, MC program at Fort Valley State. So hello to my Wildcats. As you said, I'm a PhD student in plant and soil science at the University of Delaware. 
Um, my work focuses on using digital soil mapping and machine learning techniques to look at soil characteristics, currently looking at the spatial variability of nitrogen and moving towards um, model sensitivity and soil respiration. Um, so yes, yeah, so I got into uh, the geosciences, like I said, through the CDEP program my freshman year, we went to the uh, USGS headquarters and I just fell in love and I was like, I have to do this. Um, and also reiterating the importance of internships. My going into my senior year at Spelman, I did an internship again at USGS, but at Woods Hole and fell in love with research and knew that that's what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. So I applied to graduate school, um, got a fully funded position at the University of Delaware, worked on my grant writing and I'm also a, a NSF graduate research fellow. So I'm in it for the long call. How excellent, Elizabeth, especially being an HBCU graduate. Well done. Next up is Crystal Tully Cordova, who serves as a principal hydrologist for the Navajo Nation Department of Water Resources. Over to you, Dr. Tully Cordova. Yad e she crystal tuli cordova yenishia quidditch eating the shlank, patnez at ne bushes chin, hush on had zoha edasha che tu, he cleaning edasha nulle, bisto clision dej gij do, twathagai dant nasha. So I just shared my introduction in the Navajo language. I am Crystal Tuli Cordoba. I am of the Bitterwater clan, born for the Tangle People clan. My maternal grandfather's clan is the yucca fruit strung on a line and my paternal grandfather's clan is the water that flows together. So naturally I would go into water. I am a principal hydrologist at the Navajo Nation Department of Water Resources, water management branch. And I've had a great opportunity to be able to, you know, not necessarily have a knowledge about what I wanted to do early on. Uh, I've always been an explorer and scientist Early in my life, growing up around magnificent features like my virtual background and as in places like Monument Valley, Canyon de Chez, Grand Canyon, naturally that beauty um, also encouraged me to learn more. And so I went to the University of New Mexico. I initially was a double E major. Unfortunately, I wasn't very good at programming and so had the hard uh, thought process of, you know, really having an, a reflection of what I wanted to do in my life. And from that point forward, knew that I had a lot of connection to having knowledge about where I am from and where water is stored. So in the southwestern United States, we rely upon groundwater with uh, securing our water rights. We've had the opportunity to do water development associated with surface water. Uh, so my degree is in bachelor's of uh, Earth and Planetary Sciences from the University of New Mexico, a master's in water resources also from the University of New Mexico. Uh, intermittently throughout my undergrad and master's, I did a lot of internships. I recommend internships highly. It tells you what you like and what you don't like and what you'd want to do for the rest of your life or maybe what you don't want to do the rest of your life. And it also provides you an opportunity to be able to have an understanding of what skills you may need to strengthen as you progress toward a career. So I worked, instead of doing work study, I worked at Los Alamos National Lab. Uh, I commuted by train and by bus two hours each way from Albuquerque to Los Alamos to be able to gain research understanding. And from that point forward, um, realized I wanted to do a PhD. I got my PhD from the University of Utah in geology. And then I also got a interdisciplinary graduate certificate in sustainability. And now I have the great opportunity to be able to use all of that I've learned throughout the years to help my tribal nation. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Crystal. That opened my eyes to so many things, so thank you. Now I have the pleasure to introduce a former member of National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine Committee on Seismology and Geodynamics, Sherilyn Williams Stroud, a research scientist and structural geologist at the Illinois State Geological Survey, Dr. Williams Stroud. Thank you, Tamika. Um, First, I want to say how proud I am of where you've come because I met you when you were just uh, still, I think you were 
still in high school <laughs> when we first met. And I, I um, um, just want to make a plug for uh, Ike Crumley's program because I think that program is doing a lot to help increase diversity in geosciences. Um, my background, I guess I, I'll start as, as um, from when I was a kid, and I'll try to go through this very quickly. Um, I'm a second generation uh, college graduate, I, the first to get a PhD. Um, all of my aunts and my mom, everybody's an educator. So they all taught um, elementary school or high school. And my father worked at the defense mapping agency as a cartographer. Um, I didn't know what he did because in those days, what everything he was doing was secret, but it wasn't the reason that I went into geoscience. I went to Oberlin College as an undergraduate because I was going to be a musician. And I fell in, I discovered geology like so many of us do once we get into college and um, get exposed to it. And I thought, well, that's what I want to do. And um, I got my bachelor's degree from Oberlin College, my PhD from Johns Hopkins University. And um, while I was working on my PhD, I had the opportunity to work at the uh, US Geological Survey. Um, in one of the labs there, I had lots of college jobs, part-time jobs at the USGS. And that was to me sort of my determined, um, predetermined pathway. So I started my career working at the USGS as a research geologist. I worked there for 10 years. And then I went to oil and gas industry. So um, most of my career has been in oil and gas, working for large operators, Texaco, Chevron, Occidental Oil and Gas, or for um, um, consulting our service companies. And, um, and so I've seen both sides of, of the industry in terms of, of um, sort of development, technology development within the industry or, or actually operating oil and gas fields. Um, but now I'm back in government working for this uh, Illinois State Geological Survey, doing research on CO2 sequestration and induced seismicity. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. William Stroud. Lastly, we have Amanda Labrado, who is a Geological Society of America, Uni US Geological Survey Congressional Science Fellow and a biogeochemist with a broad background in earth environmental sciences, Dr. Amanda Labrado. Hey there, uh, it's really great to, um, to meet you all and uh, to be part of this panel. And so thank you for that. And thank you to Mika for the introduction. Uh, like she said, my name is Amanda Labrado and I am born and raised uh, from El Paso, Texas. So hey there, <laughs> all of my fellow El Pasoans. It's really great to have you all. Um, I received my PhD this past May in the geological sciences from the University of Texas, El Paso. So go miners. I um, also received my bachelor's from there um, in environmental science with a focus on geology and then went to Penn State to get my master's in geoscience. And so during uh, my undergrad, I also participated in several internships and it is a huge, huge bo uh, bonus to do so during your undergrad and graduate degrees if you can. Um, my first one was uh, at the Sevieta National Fish and Wildlife Refuge where they had a long-term ecological research project going on and had research experiences for undergrads. Um, and my second one was at Penn State uh, through Africa Array, which is how I was introduced to my advisor at that point. The last one that I did was during a gap year between my undergraduate degree and my master's. And it was actually the one that really helped me realize what I wanted to do and what I wanted to focus on. It was with UNAPCO Recess. And I was able to um, look at the intersection between living and non-living things. And that's how I entered uh, the world of biogeochemistry and astrobiology. Um, and so if you have the chance to participate in programs like that, do it. I also started at a community college and then worked my way up. Um, so there is no issue with that. I know a lot of people see that as a negative. I saw it as a bonus or a positive. Um, and so, yeah, that's me. Excellent, Amanda. Thank you so much. Excellent panel. Ran on time with 30 minutes left to take questions and answers. Uh, for the committee members, school participants, and agency representatives who would like to ask a question of our panelists, 
please use raise the hand function in the feature of Zoom so that we can unmute you. For the public attendees watching the webcast, please contribute your ideas into Slido and we'll work to bring those into the conversation. To get us organized a bit on the online questions, I will start. My key to success has been having role models, not just mentors, but role models, someone that looks like me in the science world. One of those role models is Williams, Dr. William Stroud. From your experience, Dr. William Stroud, can you highlight key variations from geoscience roles within private sector, such as petroleum, versus government agencies? So um, when I worked at the USGS, I was in the office of, um, I don't remember what they called it, but it was energy um, resources. So we did a lot of uh, research related to oil and gas. And to me, the biggest difference was um, that when you're working in, working in government, you're doing science in the public in interest. And, and when I joined the USGS, the model was earth science in the public interest. And I really, that really um, resonated with me. Um, going to industry, um, it's the earth science, the, what you're doing there is basically, you know, it's a business. So you're developing, um, science or doing science to help the bottom line for the business. Um, mm -hmm. It's applied in both cases. One is for um, public, the public interest and the other one is for the, the profit of the, the big business. Um, so, so those are the main, the main, the two main differences. Thank you. Anyone else would like to add into that? Well, mm -hmm. Let, let me add also in, in terms of the, um, the workplace, the environment, um, I guess in government, <laughs> I went from government um, uh, accessibility to uh, open data. And then in, in the private sector, there's, there was so much gorgeous, <laughs> high quality, expensive data available. Um, so there's, I think you have to decide what you want to do in, um, whether you want to work with this great data and have it be a lot of it be proprietary, but you still know you're advancing in science, some of it comes out eventually anyway, or um, work with data that's um, publicly available, not maybe not as large data sets or um, as comprehensive data sets. Um, but I think that that's one of the um, one of the main one of the differences in the work environment. But I also wanted to point out that. Um, the teams are pretty much the same, right? You have collaborative teams, people um, work together and share um, to develop whatever your goal is together the same way um, with the same, like, like now I'm at the, at the uh, Illinois State Geological Survey. Some of what we're doing is working with operators. So that would be business. But what we wanna do is, is create things that are applied that help the business, but also help the environment. So um, with the CO2, projects. Excellent. Thank you. We have a few questions. Oh, you, would you like to add on to that, Dr. Diallo? Go for it. Yes. I just wanted to add that, you know, my background is boss. I'm currently at the National Science Foundation, but I am what's called IPA, inter intergovernment personal agency. That means I work with the university, but I'm currently at the National Science Foundation. I'm at Caltech. So what I'm trying to get at is at the university, I had to build bridges between my colleagues from several disciplines to get work together. I have to work with people that are bio engineers. So you got to get to a point where you feel comfortable about really reaching out to people that are not necessarily trained the same way you are, but that's mm -hmm. quick solving our big problem. And that's the same thing my job at NSF is. I got to build a bridge across different disciplines. And most importantly, you have to work with people. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Since you just spoke, Dr. William Stroud, I just I think it's more of a comment uh, that you may be more familiar with. The National Geospatial Intelligence Agency says that the Defense Mapping Agency is one of our predecessor organizations. So they wanted to uh, give you a shout out there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. So the first hand that I saw was saw raised was Dr. Carr. So Dr. Carr came from Fort Valley State University. Can you come off mute? 
Uh, hello. Um, I'm going to come a little bit forward. So I am here from Fort Valley State University. I'm a professor here in geosciences. I have three students, and one I can claim, Amanda, I can claim as my student, but um, Tomika and Elizabeth, I have the opportunity to teach them at some point. And so we are in my geology lab. We are joining from here. It's so great to see all of your stories and really um, and Dr. Straub is a role model for me, you know, uh, uh, people knew everybody's story is so great. Um, the students, uh, you have a question. There are a lot of MC students here also uh, who have gone through the same pathway that Kamika and Elizabeth has. And um, so they are hearing your story. I just wanted to comment that this is a great thing that you guys have done and 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 National Faculty of Sciences. So thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Carr. Thank you. Oh, Wildcats, go ahead. Go ahead with your question. Hi, uh, my question are for those who went through the MC program. I was wondering, did the MC program prepare you for your current career choice now, or was it some, some other beneficial factor? Elizabeth, I will go to you to answer that question on how well MC, the high school pro program, prepared you for your roles. Uh, I would say that the because I, I didn't do the CETA program for undergraduate, but for high school, it really prepared me for college and helped me open my mind to a field that I hadn't thought about before. Um, and even open my network. I talked to Dr. Crumbly all the time and still keep up with the people that were in my class, the ones that went into geoscience. So I would say that it helped me in learning how to network um, and how to do research or initially how to do research. That was something that I wasn't prepared for before. So I would say yes, it got the ball. Absolutely second that. I will say that we're not on a panel, but two things. It introduced me to the in the energy industry. You know, it expanded me outside of, you know, textile industry. It brought me to the energy industry. So whether it was oil and gas, whether it was wind, whether it was solar, I really expanded in high school on what, how do we bring energy to the homes of the world? And so for me, MC was fantastic. The second was communications. I was fair. I was always um, shy in school. So here I am leading and moderating today. So that's the two things. So those skits that you do during the summer, perfect for talking. All righty. Uh, one of the following questions was for Dr. Labrado, Amanda. Would, would you be able to elaborate a bit on your start at the community college? Did you have geosciences in mind when you started? What got you interested in geosciences? Yeah, so I started doing dual credit in high school um, and just knew that I really loved science, period. And so when I went to college, um, I was doing the dual program with EPCC and UTEP that lets you take classes at both and be a student of both at once. And so it was really helpful because we all know college is very expensive. And so I was able to afford my classes more easily. Um, but I didn't know I wanted to go into geology initially. Um, I love science. I wanted to actually do biology, but when I went to orientation, the sign-up table was really long for biology majors. So I went over to the environmental science table because there were less people and it seemed a little bit broader and like it had different opportunities to not only engage with biology, but also geology and chemistry. And so I really liked that it brought everything together. And that's why I ended up doing geology to begin with. Um, and I've always collected rocks. We're from, a, I'm from El Paso, Texas, like I said. And so we have the Franklin Mountains right there in our backyard. And I was always hiking. I was always outside. I was always picking up rocks. And so when somebody told me I could do that for my career, I thought, well, I mean, this is perfect. So um, I fell into it accidentally, but it has been the best thing that has ever happened. So thank God for long lines. All right. Thanks, Amanda. Next, we have an online hand raise from Paulina Reyes. Paulina, can you come off mute and ask your question? Hello, good morning. I wanted to ask a question to Dr. Tilly Cordoba about how um, 
she came upon that decision for her career. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, for my career, it, it's always been about a passion of what I enjoyed. And so if you're going to do something the rest of your life, I recommend that it's something that you enjoy and not a, something that you regret in the morning, like, oh, I have to get up and work, like have that type of attitude. But instead, you know, for me, it started with a fourth grade science project, really my introduction with water. And it was a water filtration project. I won the school science fair, went to a bigger city, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and presented there. Unfortunately, I didn't win there. But what I did realize is that, you know, I really enjoyed the scientific process, making hypotheses, trying to determine if I was right or wrong. And in my work, I have an opportunity to still use those problem solving skills to be able to help um, with water development, securing water rights. Oftentimes with geosciences, sometimes people think the only career is with um, energy or other industries. Um, but in fact, with geosciences, there's a number of opportunities within the geosciences. You can be a seismologist, you can study volcanoes, you can work with water like I do. I mean, there's a plethora of job opportunities out there and geoscientists are greatly needed, especially geoscientists from diverse backgrounds. Excellent, yeah, I love that journey. Thanks, Crystal. Uh, righty, so <clears throat> I will direct this question to Jordan Marie, starting out, then someone can chime in if you like. Please indicate if networking at and attending local and regional professional meetings help you find internships. Because Yes, um, so I'll say that Networking is probably one of um, the most important things for the advancement of my career. Um, so, so I mentioned that I, I took that year off after um, undergraduate school and um, I met a few different people. Um, one of them was in uh, environmental consulting actually. And they were, at the time, they, they were a mentor even though I didn't realize that they were a mentor, but they um, steered me in the direction of various internships and put things in my, um, my field of view that I wouldn't have known about otherwise. Um, and so that's also part of the reason why I ended up doing that internship in Arizona with uh, Freeport McMoran um, was because this person had suggested um, that I try something like that just to see if that would be um, a route that would work for me. So um, networking has definitely, definitely been a, a very big um, uh, proponent of my of my career. So uh, my answer to that is yes. Thank you. And if I, yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to chime in really quickly. So Dr. Carr, uh, who is from um, at the SU, uh, knows that one of the reasons I received a Chevron internship during my doctoral degree was because I was part of Africa Ray during my undergrad and attended one of the Africa Ray's annual meetings. And so um, networking has been huge. The only reason I was part of Africa Ray was because I did the Sevieta RU my first year in college. And the only reason that I did that was because I grew um, very close to my advisor, my undergraduate advisor in the department. So networking opens so many doors and people just want to know that you're interested and that you'll make the effort to go above and beyond sometimes. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think, you know, Dr. Dielo's career path really was highlighted by his networking and, and his attendance at different conferences and uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, attending conference were critical. Like my Caltech postdoc was like the connection was made at an American Chemical Society meeting. The Caltech professor that came to give a talk in chemistry at University of Michigan and said, by the way, are you attending the ACS in uh, August? Uh, it was August 2000, I mean, one, yeah, uh, 1994, right before I graduated. I'm like, yes, he's like, why don't you come and I will introduce you to you know, uh, a few Caltech professors. And one of them was my future advisor and mentor of like probably 20 years. And I got introduced to that person at that conference. So by all means, 
uh, networking is critical and go to these conferences when you get the opportunity. Good, thank you. Elizabeth, uh, I can imagine you have a couple of mentors, you know, kind of through from Fort Valley Z's program, Spelman program. How can you find and maintain mentors as you move through your studies and early career? Mm, it is very important, but I think they also find you. Um, mm -hmm. like I said, I, I still talk to Dr. Crumbly. He's also the reason that I'm on this panel. Um, I still reach out to people that I know at Spelman and the internship that I mentioned that I did at um, USGS has been the most monumental. My mentor there, Dr. John Pullman, wrote one of my recommendation letters for graduate school. He encouraged it. We were just talking about um, going to uh, meetings and things. He encouraged me to present at the American Geophysical Union meeting, which is where I met my PhD advisor. So it's just um, important to one, tell these people thank you and that you're grateful for what they have done for you. Um, and then just keep them updated on what you're doing because they'll continue to write you letters of recommendation. And then you can also feed them back information that helps them help other students. Um, and it, it's just important that you can ask them really anything. I usually ask them questions about science, but also, you know, if I'm not sure if I want to apply for one position over the other, or if I'm having trouble navigating school, graduate school is difficult, especially when you are the only person in your family in geoscience and, it's, and you're trying to figure out something, you're just like, I can't figure out this R code for anything. They're helpful for that. And that's what they're there for. So I would say one, thanking them for what um, they've done for you and just keeping the channel of communication open, whether it's something small or something big, they just want to know what you're doing. Great, yeah. Thanks for highlighting one of the functional roles of a mentor is recommendation letters. I mean, it's really key to ensure that whatever project or interaction that you've had on them, highlight what your strengths are so that they can, you know, support you in your next position or your upcoming, you know, role or posting. So really, really thank you for that. Right. Is there anything, this question would be uh, directed to uh, Crystal. Is there anything you might have done differently with your career if you had known where you are today? Would you do something different? And I might highlight Dr. Str William Stroud off that. Yeah, I think one of the things is just to embrace who you are and what your natural desires were. So I, from place-based knowledge of the place that I grew up, was a lot of geology and a lot of water. And I already knew I was interested in that, but when you're 18 and you're wanting to be this cool new person that is has new freedom that you haven't had before, you kind of want to push what you think you want to be. And what I wanted to do, why I went into double E is, in all honesty is because I wanted to make more money. And now thinking back now, that was you know pretty immature to think about money when you can think about happiness. And the job that I'm in now, I have the great opportunity to be able to not only help myself and, you know, make money and make a living, but then to help a larger community of Indigenous people and the largest tribe in the United States. Um, so it's really a great opportunity to, you know, sometimes we just need to embrace who we are and em embrace that individual duality, um, especially because when you go out there, I mean, you see that you're, I mean, at my institution that I ended my PhD at, like a minority of the minority, and that brings challenges in itself, imposter syndrome, you know, you begin to question, are you really where you need to be? But if you embrace that individuality and stand up and accept, you know, hey, I'm here because of the ancestors before me, and I'm going to be here because of the future generations depending on me. Yeah. Great. Dr. William Stroud, would there be something different you've done so in your career? I, I just want to say, Crystal, thank you for mentioning that imposter syndrome thing. And, and that's something that I wish I didn't have in my mm -hmm. early days, right? Because I grew up, I, I started in the era of affirmative action where everybody was acting like the reason and actually had some classmates that told me the reason I was there was because 
I was black, right? Not because I deserved to be there or could do the work. And that kind of, you know, stuck in the back of my mind a lot of times. And I didn't always take the opportunities that um, are, are chances that were in front of me. I, but other than that, I don't think I would have done anything different because what I did was whenever something new and interesting came, I was willing to try it, right? And, and it was kind of like, um, Dr. Diallo, like if you have some some other thing that uh, another opportunity that looks interesting, um, um, and it and you want to try it and you are able to take advantage of that opportunity, I encourage people to do that if you have that kind of spirit. Because I I got exposed to a lot of different things in a lot of different countries because of that. So that in that way, I wouldn't change it at all, but I would try to have more confidence that I had a right to be there. Right. Mm -hmm. In my early career days, I always kind of questioned or, or listened to the voices that were implying that maybe I wasn't as good as they were. Mm -hmm. Just chime in here. I actually did not have that problem because I grew up in Dakar, Senegal, and I wanted to do science. Nobody would tell me that I could not go ask questions because I look a certain way. I, I mean, it was like when I came in the U.S., I realized Sometimes when I hear people say that, I look at them like, this is nonsense. Anyway, to, for me, I, I spent seven years as a professor in South Korea at KAIST. KAIST is like, you know, the MIT Caltech of South Korea. I represented Korea in international conference and people were looking at me like, are you Korean? I'm like, no, I'm adopted Korean. So, so my point is like, follow your science and science will prevail. So I realized that I did not have the same background because I came here and I did not have those uh, really the things that hold me back. I realized those are important, the sense of belonging. You just have to work through that and follow uh, the opportunity. Fantastic, absolutely. All right, my apologies, Paulina. Would you come off mute and ask your second question? I was worried that it was just, from previous, but yes, please, please answer, ask a question. Thank you. Um, good morning, Dr. William Stroud. I wanted to ask you if you could please tell me, explain, um, does your work involves traveling a lot? And if you do, what equipment do you constantly use? Thank you. So um, most of my travel in oil and gas was, um, my equipment was my computer, right? But um, I did some, um, I did a lot of core analysis, which you don't, you know, you don't take equipment with you for that. You're just, you know, looking at the cores and, um, and um, making a log of what you see. Um, I did do at the USGS, um, when in that case, travel was when I worked on the Yucca Mountain project, every other week we'd go out to Nevada and map. So that's just your basic geological mapping um, equipment. But because most of my career has been in the oil and gas industry, uh, people at you know at one point were calling it Nintendo geology. Most of since your your field is in the subsurface, you can't go out to see it except for when you get to go to a field trip to look at an analog. You're just working um, in your office when you're uh, um, to build your geological models using the computer. So in that case, the travel um, was to meet with other people that you're working with in the business environment. Or when I was working for the consulting and service companies, the travel was to go and meet with people that you wanted to recruit for as clients or to build or, or to um, um, buy your software. So it was more in that case, meeting with people and collaborating in person. Tamika, you're muted. Almost. We have a question from Navajo Tech. Come off mute and ask a question, please. Good afternoon. Uh, we are here from, uh, we are a tribal university from New Mexico and uh, Crystal, thank you for everything you do. You are a great role model for our students. And uh, we know that how important, like, you know, tying up culture with science is and how, like, you know, all our students are really motivated to do 
to able to do something for their community. So, and thank you everyone for sharing your story. And I just wanted to ask you guys to share uh, with our students that failure is a part of the success, right? So how you guys have overcome failure because from a cultural background and from a like you know diverse student body, that's something we face every day. And I want our students to know that they should not stop. They should carry on and they will be successful. So if you guys can share and thank you, uh, National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine for like, you know, giving us the opportunity to uh, be part of this um, endeavor. Thank you. Great. So I'll start that question off with Jordan Marie, rounding up with Crystal um, to, to how do you approach challenges or failures in your career? And we'll probably just take everyone to close out with. Yeah, Jordan. Thanks, Tamika. Um, so I can actually uh, start this one with an example. Um, so uh, when I was an undergraduate student, um, and I think because of my background and because I didn't have um, too many people to look at that were in STEM careers, uh, I went to school thinking, I'm going to study STEM, so I'm going to become a doctor. I'm going to go to medical school. Um, and that just because that was that was all that I knew. That's what I thought was available to me. And so um, I went through undergraduate school. Um, I enjoyed my chemistry coursework, um, but I, I realized that I didn't actually want to be a doctor. Um, and I wasn't actually able to admit that until it was ready to, it was ready to, I was ready to apply to, to different medical school programs. And I was talking with an advisor um, and they had informed me that um, my transcript might not be as strong as I thought it was to get into medical school. And at that time, I remember feeling like completely defeated, right? Because I, I came in here thinking that that was what I was going to do and that was the only thing that I could do with this degree. Um, and so in order to, to get over that, um, it kind of forced me to just take a step back um, to, uh, to think about what was going on, to think about what it was that I, you know, I actually wanted to do. Um, and um, that's what ultimately led me to that decision where I, I took a year off from school and ended up exploring these other opportunities. So for me, um, my first approach to failure is to kind of just take a back seat, to kind of, you know, pull down, um, think about what went wrong, and then figure out what's the best way to approach this moving forward. Um, and then through doing that and through giving myself that time, I was able to realize that this wasn't actually something that I wanted to do anyway, um, and that there were other options out there um, that fit my skill set um, and that fit my interests better. Great. Thank you, Crystal. I might just start out with, you know, I'm, I'm the first person in my family to get a PhD. So that's like looking at my parents' as, um, family and beyond, not just like my family with my siblings, but my cousins and my aunts and uncles. And so I didn't know what a PhD really meant. Um, and I guess, you know, what I thought was you get under an advisor and then you have a project that's handed to you. And then like, you have to stick with that your whole PhD career. But I started working on urban streams in Salt Lake City. And I knew I didn't want to go into urban streams. Like I really wasn't involved, like motivated to do the research. So I had that conversation with my advisor. Um, first things first, like my advisor was like the Doogie Hauser of his field. Had I known that, I probably would have never like asked to be his student because the bar was set super high. Um, but that the hard part was telling him like, Hey, I don't know a lot about stable isotopes and I don't even like urban waters. So it came to the point of, you know, well, what do you like? And unfortunately there was no funding in that. Right. So it, it, it was this toss of like, do I take a chance and do the research that I love and have no money to do it? Or do I continue on this path where that's more secure? What I ended up doing, and I'm not a gambler, um, is that I chose to do something that I would love and do a research in an area that I loved more. And that was where I'm from. So there, you know, sometimes it seems like a black hole. The Navajo Nation is over 27,000 square miles, similar to size as West Virginia or the country of Ireland. And I saw that there was a need to quantify precipitation variability across this large region, but also to be able to find out more about the North American monsoon where 
which is a major contributor to precipitation in this region. And use stable isotopes to know what my grandmother knew all along. She always taught me that all water is connected and through deuterium and oxygen 18, I was able to prove what we've known for centuries. Thank you. Thank you. If hopefully the committee will give me a little room. If you guys could do one sentence to leave with the students in the panel for each Amanda, Mamadou, Elizabeth and Dr. Straub. Amanda. I suppose my closing sentence is just to believe in yourself, no matter what anybody else will tell you, uh, you are worthy, you are intelligent, and your experiences do not detract from you as a person, they only add to you. So failure will happen, it's not about if, it's about when, and just keep trucking along. Thank you. Dr. Diallo. Uh, follow the opportunity and uh, don't give up. And uh, every problem, there will be challenges. Like you get to a point where you feel like you're gonna walk through the challenge and you're gonna solve it and believe that. I actually believe that myself. Yeah, beautiful. Elizabeth. A career in science isn't about instant gratification. Um, so the results won't be there always, but there's always another method that you can try. Mm -hmm. Dr. William Stroud. I would say um, if you find someone who's supportive of you and believes in you, make sure you um, use that person as a mentor. I don't mean use, but you know, stick with that person because those are the people that help you get navigate your career. So, and there are, there is a lot of them out there. So keep your eyes open for those people because those are the ones that are going to help you build your confidence and build your network. Beautiful panel, guys. This was, I could wish I could just package you up and send you out to all of the underrepresented groups around there. You have really opened our eyes and, and gave great advice and shared your stories that can lead to success um, for everyone within government agencies or whatever path they choose. So thank you so much. This marks the end of the public session webinar. For those schools and oh, another big thank you, sorry, back up. A big thanks to each panelist the ones who had questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This marks the end of the public session webinar. For those schools and agencies that were invited to the private session, please stay on the call. Thanks again, everyone. Have a good day. <laughs>